Jesus told a story once, told a story about a son, about a son who decided to go uh, run away from home, leave his father, took his inheritance early, offended his father, broke the relationship. And then he goes off, if you know the story, and he wastes all the money on a selfish, sinful, dark lifestyle until he finally wakes up. And when he finally wakes up, he's empty and his bank account is empty. And he's feeding pigs the way that Jesus tells the story. And he's starving to death. And he finally comes to his senses. And when he comes to his senses, if you remember the story, he regrets his decisions. You ever regret your decisions? He regrets his decisions. And when he regrets his decisions and he finally comes to his senses, he starts looking for a road that will take him back to his father back to God. We've been talking the last few weeks that um, according to some surveys that have been done that we've become aware of, there may be as many as 60,000 people in Lawton, Oklahoma who don't have a meaningful relationship with a local church, unchurched. That's a lot of prodigals. That's a lot of people who need to find their way back to God. You can amen second service. We all right? They need to find their way back to God. And as they find their way back to God, let me just remind you, we are not the solution to that. We're just people, amen? We're just a church. God himself is the one who's been calling to them their whole lives long, yes? He's the one who's been loving them. He's the one who's been sending blessings into their life and protection into their life, even rebuke and truth and correction into their life. Sometimes God sends people into your life to speak truth to you, doesn't he? Many of you who follow God today, if you told your testimony, you would tell me about somebody who God sent to you to get through to you. So is it possible that God might use us in his great lifelong work to bring some of these people back to him. We got to help them find their way back to God by whatever means we have. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't rest on us. It rests on him, thank God. But God, what can we do? Help people find their way back to God. There was a guy named Dan um, who I used to talk with and um, he and I would go to a coffee shop and he would have questions uh, about God and, and he didn't believe and, and he, his questions were more philosophical in nature. Um, and I would tremble a little bit in his questions because most of them I didn't know the answers. And he would ask and, and I would say, hey, how about I go find a book? Because uh, there was no Google in those days because that's how old I am. Um, let me find a book and, or find a pastor and I'm going to ask them and, and I'm going to get back to you. Can I get back to you? And he was kind. Yeah, you can get back to me. And I think he appreciated the honesty that I could say I didn't know an answer. And that went on for a while and, and all those seeds got planted between Dan and me. And, and I remember he came to me at one point and he said, you know, I don't really believe yet, but if there's a bridge between my atheism and believing in God and following Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm, I'm closer to the believing than I used to be. Amen. And he's like, and I'm so close, Josh. He's like, I don't even think I can go back anymore. There was a guy named Todd that I used to work for. He was my boss when I was in technology and Todd was a former Marine, is a former Marine. And Todd taught me a, a whole lot about how to code and, and he was really tough on me. And, and if I would ask Todd a dumb question, he would say, um, read the stinking manual. But he didn't say stinking. <laughs> but he was a good guy and and all he was trying to do is he was just trying to teach me um, how to be responsible and independent. And um, anyway, we had this relationship. And I, I remember us going on break one time and he just tells me out of the blue, he's like, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. And I didn't have a good answer for him, but we talked and we engaged and a friendship was built. And I didn't have these amazing answers. I don't want to give you the wrong idea. 
But this relationship happened and Linda and I went to his wedding and um, I saw the, the movie The Matrix for the first time with Todd. That's a detail you didn't need, but I just told you anyway. <laughs> But there was this friendship, and then he moved away, and, and, and we weren't close for, for a long time. And then all of a sudden, I ran into him in the middle of Walmart. And, and, and here's the thing. I thought I'd planted these seeds in, in Todd's life of relationship and truth and spirituality, maybe, my, my relationship with Jesus. But I didn't think anything had come of it. All of a sudden, I run into him in Walmart years later. His family was going through a crisis, and he walks up to me out of the blue and says, where do you go to church? And I get to baptize Todd. Close friend of mine today. And sometimes you're having these conversations and you're like, God, I feel like I'm failing. What am I even doing right now? Oh God, be there. All right? Be compassionate. Be courageous. Speak the truth. But be there. Be a human being be there. Like, like we're, we're, we're going through these next several weeks in Easter, guys, and I'm just, this is just so heavy on my heart. Like, we got yard signs, and we got t-shirts, and all this stuff is just announcing to the community his name is Jesus, and some of it's going to announce to the community that you're a part of that, and that might lead to easier conversations about what's going on in your life and what's going on in their life. Could you bring compassion and could you bring courage to those conversations? Today is a day of training. I'm here to disciple you in this. When someone comes along, one of your fears is, I won't know what to say. You're right. Right? Like, what if they say, I don't have any science or philosophical questions but someone close to me died and God let that happen and I didn't feel God's presence around me when it happened. Explain to me where in the world God was at. Can you? Or do you just need to listen and love and be present and do your best and not try to fix and not try to say things that you don't know or don't mean? People need us to engage, yes? Yes. Sometimes what, what, what people have been hurt by and the reason that they're coming back to God and they've got distance today is because they saw hypocrisy in the church or somebody hurt them. What's the right answer to that? It gets complicated, doesn't it? Be honest, be real, be a person, be loving, listen. When someone comes along and you don't know what to say, um, I've got an answer for you. This is Luke chapter 12, verse 11. This is Jesus talking. He says, when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Now, I, I know I'm just talking about little conversations between you and one other person, right? And then I leapt to this big example. But it's the same principle, because I love what he has to say here. He says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Here's what that says to me. Sometimes you can have all the knowledge in the world, but that doesn't mean that you know which part of the knowledge you're supposed to share in the moment with which with person. That's discernment. That's wisdom. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need God guiding you. What good is it to have an amazing education? If you don't know discernment wise, what it is that this person needs, he says, the Holy Spirit will give it to you. And I know he says, when you get brought into like trials and stuff and before great authorities, but even in the small things, God will tell you what to say. And he says, don't worry. Don't worry. God will guide you in those moments. So today we're going to Acts chapter six. And we're going to the end of Acts chapter six. If you're a note taker, you got your Bible, go ahead and get that out. We're, we're talking about Stephen today. And Stephen is the very first Christian in history to die for Christ, to die for the faith. He was the very first martyr. So here's a quick summary of today's message. You might get put on the spot this Easter season in a conversation with 
a neighbor or a classmate or a friend, and that's okay. Stephen was also put on the spot, and Stephen was killed at the end, but you probably won't be. <laughs> it took a long time to get out there, but a little, little humor for you. Um, we're going to observe some things from Stephen's life, and hopefully it's going to make sense all by the end of this. Um, Stephen is an example, and we talked about this in the very first week in Acts. Um, there are things that are described in Acts, and there are things that are prescribed or commanded in Acts. This is stuff that is described, but even the stuff that is described for us, it's narrative, it's history, I think you're going to see principles of a great man of God and the way he responded in the moment that he was in. We're going to try and pull that out. So this is Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Um, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with Stephen. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. Just a real quick pause there. Um, part of what you need to know is that particular synagogue and those areas, that's where Saul or the apostle Paul came from originally. He's going to pop up later. Verse 10, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So this is God filling him and giving the words in the moment and they couldn't stand against it. So verse 11, so they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. And this roused the people, the elders and the teachers of the religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The high council there is the Sanhedrin. Now that's an important detail. Here's why. Because the way that Dr. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is laying this story out for us is he's going to show us how similar this whole scene is between Stephen and also the trial of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin at his trial. Jesus could not be withstood in argument. And so they brought false witnesses who came and lied against Jesus. It's the only way that they got him to trial. It's the same thing with Stephen, and that's not where the similarities end. There's a whole lot more. Okay, so this, this roused the high council. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 7, then the high priest, that's Caiaphas, asked Stephen, are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Now just pause right there. The high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? The reason we're pausing is this. Caiaphas is giving Stephen an opportunity to defend himself. Caiaphas is giving him a way out. Don't miss that in the drama. Stephen, what's on the line for him as a person could be punishment. It could be jail. It might even be death. So here's your opportunity. Defend yourself. An argument could be made that he should have. He doesn't. He doesn't defend himself. Instead, he preaches a sermon. And this is just the beginning of the sermon that he gives. Why would he do that? What I believe is the reason is because when Stephen looks out at this council, at the people who are coming against him, instead of seeing a room full of enemies, he sees a room full of prodigals. He sees people who are far from God and people who need God. And he realizes that he has a moment, he has a platform, and he has a microphone, and he wants to use it for their good. Does that get you today? Ah, he gets me. Um, verse four, um, Stephen's sermon. I'm gonna lay this, the rest of this sermon out for you. Uh, Stephen starts into this sermon and he preaches for 50 solid verses. You thought I went long sometimes. This is a long, long sermon. Um, 
There's a lot of great qualities in this sermon that I want to point out to you, um, but I'm just going to uh, give you an outline for your notes if you would like that. Um, The way he does this is he starts with verse four to eight, how God built Abraham's family and the patriarchs and started the nation of Israel. Why is that important? He does this because he begins with what they have in common, the Old Testament, says, you know the Old Testament and so do I. You trust the Old Testament, you see its truth. Like we're not on the same page with Jesus, but we are here. And if you're gonna build a bridge, you gotta start on solid ground, amen? And so he starts his bridge on solid ground and tells him about Abraham. And then in verse nine to 19, he gets all the way to Joseph who wore the amazing Technicolor dream coat, if you remember Joseph. And Joseph was thrown in the pit by his brothers. But Joseph had had this dream from God for his family. And Stephen pulls that out and he says, the person that was sent from God, almost a savior to the family. And Joseph would become a savior to his family. His brothers rejected their savior. And so he's going to pull that out as a theme. And he's going to show it to him in the Old Testament. And then he jumps to verse 20 through 36. He talks about God sending Moses to rescue Israel. And he recounts all these different ways that the people had also rejected Moses when he was sent. And then he jumps to 37 to 38. And he reminds them that Moses is one of the people who had predicted Jesus. The coming of the Messiah. He's like, Moses, who wrote your law, Moses, that you respect so much in your Old Testament, he predicted the Messiah. Moses had said, a prophet like me will come. He had the attributes. Jesus had the attributes of Moses, miracle working power, amazing teaching, leadership, protection, shepherding. It was all a prophet like me will come. And he says, a prophet like me will come from your people, from our people, from the Israelite nation. So he reminds them of that. And then he, he talks about the fact that Israel had rejected Moses at the golden calf and through their idol worship down through the ages. Again, every savior God sends to you, Israel, you reject. And then finally, he ends with this little moment um, about Solomon building the temple. He gives six verses to that. Um, If you studied the gospels, you know that one of the things that Jesus had said that got him in trouble is he said, "Um, take this Jewish temple and if you destroy it, he said, I'll raise it again in three days. And he meant the temple of his body, but they loved their church building so much. They got massively offended that he would dare talk about the destruction of the temple. How many of you guys know that sometimes religious people get attached to their buildings? And it was massive for them. How dare he speak against the temple? Even when Jesus is brought into his uh, court proceeding, they're like, he spoke against the temple against God's house. And Jesus had not done that. But even if he had, God had told Solomon, and that's what what, uh, Stephen reminds them of here, that even when Solomon had built the temple, God had told Solomon, God the Father from heaven had told Solomon, he said, your temple can't contain me. He said, not even earth can contain God. God's just too big. And so he put it in perspective and he reminds them of that uh, from the Old Testament. And, And why is that important? It's important for a lot of reasons, but I'll just, I'll give this to you just quick. Um, When you've got a temple and that's your big, beautiful, holy place, then guess what? Everybody's got to geographically travel to it if they want to taste any holiness or have any kind of relationship with God. Everybody's got to come to you. What did Jesus do? Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to every single Christian and said, you're now the temple of God. And I call you to go into the world. Don't make the prodigals come to you. You go to the prodigals. Do you see how Jesus turned it all upside down? And Stephen wants them to know that. And so then I'm going to deliver you at verse 51 here. You stubborn people, he says, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did And so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You're like, well, that's a tone change. 
right? It's even worse than it looks there. The NLT says heathen at heart. Some of your um, uh, translations more rightly say uncircumcised in your heart. So for the Jewish people, circumcision was kind of like baptism. It was, it was their way to identify with the faith. It was the major thing that they did that, that, that makes me a Jew, right? What makes me a Christian sometimes, some of us are taught to believe, is our baptism. So there was a prophet, Jeremiah had come along and said, you might be circumcised physically, but your hearts are not. And Stephen picks up that old prophecy and he looks out in his crowd and says, you're uncircumcised in your heart. And those are kind of fighting words. Now, we're going we're gonna to try and uh, do a little bit of a balancing act here because this we got to be careful. One of the things that I told you when we did the, uh, the week on Ananias and Sapphira and we, we looked at Peter and what he had said to them was you don't know the tone of voice or the look on their face when they said certain things in the ancient text. There are no emojis in the ancient text, right? It's not easy to know. Um, and that's important for us because well, how, much, how much courage, how much confrontation, but also how much compassion are in the mix here with Stephen? Because this is a lot of confrontation. Telling them they're uncircumcised in heart, that's a lot of truth. But let me challenge you. There are other places where we know we have to finally slice the motives of the people who also talk to us, right? So I'll use an illustration. Um, if someone came to you and said, you're eating too much, you're overweight, which they'd say to nobody in this room, I promise, but if they said that, they could say it in two different ways. The first way they could come and they could say it in a very talking down to you, judgmental, um, cruel kind of way, yes? But a second person might come to you who knows you, who has authority, and they could say it with great compassion to you out of concern for you, not to put you down, but to protect you and to make you a healthier person. They could bring that truth to you. And you're like, well, the person and the tone would make all the difference in the world on whether or not I listen to them, yes? And I think it's the same thing with Stephen to them. He's giving them very, very harsh, hard truth here. But I believe his heart is compassion. That's the mix. All right, keep reading. Verse 54, the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. He has a vision of heaven itself breaks open right in that moment. And Jesus is standing up. Okay, so I got to give you some theology here so you understand this. Okay, one of the things the scripture says, especially in the book of Hebrews, it says that when Jesus died for us on the cross, and he said on the cross, you might remember these words, it is finished. Do you remember that? It is finished, second service? It is finished. When he said it is finished, the book of Hebrews says that he went to uh, the right hand of God and he sat down. He sat down and it's symbolic that he sat down. Why did he sit down? Because the high priest in the Old Testament always had to stand and they were never allowed to sit down when they were ministering to people. Why? Because people kept sinning and they had to keep doing sacrifices. They always had to be available because the sins and the sacrifices would never end. So a high priest had to always stand to represent that. But you get to Jesus and he dies for the sins of the world once for all and says, it is finished. He sits down. Do you see it? It's a big deal. So anyway, so, so that's part of our confidence, guys, is that no more sacrifice for sin is ever needed for any of us, past, present, future. If you're in Christ today, you surrendered to him and he has forgiven you your sins. You're forgiven. I love that. Okay, but all that, and now Jesus stands up again. Why? 
I think he's proud of his boy. I think he's proud of Stephen. Um, this, this language, uh, Dr. Luke is the one writing the book of Acts. And I know I'm giving you a lot today. Dr. Luke's writing the book of Acts. He says, the heavens opened. It's the same phrasing that Luke uses in Luke chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan by John. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and it says the heavens opened. Why? Because God the Father was proud of his son for walking in obedience in baptism right in that moment. And that's when the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove and God the Father says, this is my son whom I love and him I am well pleased. All that stuff happens. So this is an echo of that. So all of a sudden, Stephen's doing what he's doing. He's about to get killed and the heavens open up and Jesus stands up. Proud of his boy. Ah. Anyway, I geek out on that. Uh, Verse 57. Then they put their hands over their ears because they're angry and they began shouting. This is emotion. Do you see the emotion here? And they rushed at Stephen and they dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. And his accusers took off their coats and they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, this is a, this is a little bit gruesome, but um, they would literally pick up large stones, a crowd And they would just keep hurling those stones at the victim until they died. And this is what happens to Stephen. So they have to rush him out of town for this to happen. It's a large execution uh, crowd. And they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. They did that because it was their custom for the person who was overseeing the execution, taking spiritual responsibility for the execution, they would symbolically lay their coats at that person who was overseeing it. So Saul, do you know that name Saul? Saul is the person that in about two chapters in the book of Acts, he's about to become the apostle Paul because he's about to be converted to Christianity. But before he does, he absolutely comes against God's church. And this is one of the darkest moments in his life. Verse 59, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Again, we're, we're echoing the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Do you see it? Jesus had said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Stephen is saying the same thing. And then verse 60, he fell to his knees. And when it fell to his knees, you've got to realize he's dying. Shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, Stephen died. Don't charge them with this sin. Again, he's he's echoing what he knows his Lord did on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He says, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Lord, if if I as a Christian, as a Jesus follower, if I as a son of God have any right to say it, I pray that the records in heaven would not count this sin against them. What a bold statement. Jesus had said, In John chapter 20, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. I don't even know what that verse means. But but here's what I do know. Jesus is saying, if you forgive other people their sins against you, heaven notices. It matters. And Stephen, whatever, whatever power we have for our words and our hearts to matter toward others, Stephen spends it while he's dying. Again, why? Because he's not looking at them like enemies. He looks at them like prodigals. He looks at that crowd of people like people who need Jesus, even while they're killing him. It's one thing to have kindness and love towards somebody who's kind and loving back to you. It's a whole other thing to love them while they attack. Amen? St. Augustine, an early church father, said this. He said, if Stephen had not prayed, the church would not have had Paul. It's a big statement. If Stephen hadn't prayed what he did in that moment, out loud, the church would not have had Paul. What does he mean by that? I think he means that 
Stephen that day in the hearing of Saul, who would someday in the future be the apostle Paul, but he wasn't yet. He sowed a spiritual seed into him. And, and if you know the story, Paul's about to go on and do a whole ton of persecution against the church. The church was this mega church inside of Jerusalem. It's about to explode because of persecution. All the Christians that were this one single centralized mega church in Jerusalem, they're about to scatter across the country. And the reason is, is because they're fleeing the persecution of Saul. But man, he got forgiven that day. And I think a seed had been planted that he isn't ready to act on yet, but God's going to leverage it later on. Okay. I've given you a lot. Doing okay? Okay. All right, we're going to start pulling some principles out of this. Okay, God, if we're going to have conversations with the prodigals in our lives, the people who are finding their way back to God, how do we have those conversations? The first way I'll give to you is I think you call on God to send you people. That's the first thing. Call on God to send you people. Pray, ask God. God, maybe there's somebody on my street that's going through a crisis and they are spiritually sensitive to Jesus in a way that they have not been in years. God, would you make them cross my path? God, would you give us a connection? Bring the circumstances together. Give me an opportunity to be in their life somehow. When you pray a prayer like that to God, guys, for real, I think that's a dangerous prayer. I think God answers prayers like that. Ask him to. Ask him to bring conversations at school. Ask him to bring conversations at work. Boldly ask God, and I challenge you, see what he does. Next, chronicle your personal miracles. Again, I, I, I love that he, he takes them on a Sunday school lesson back through the Israelite people's history. What about your history lesson? Sometimes people are going to come and ask you, why are you so close to God in the first place? Why do you trust him? Why do you even love him? What would your answer be? I think the, dance, the answer is different for every single one of us. So what's your answer? I sat down with a couple. It's actually uh, um, the Garcia's pastors from uh, the church Lawton just this last week because I'm trying to get all, to know all these pastors really well. And they sat there and they recounted their whole walk and how they got into ministry with me. And man, if I would have taken notes, and I should have, I probably would have had 20 miracles by the time that conversation was done. If you chronicled your faith and your history with God, how many miracles would there be? Sometimes we don't have the quick answer because we haven't thought about it recently. Go to lunch today. Here's another challenge. Go to lunch today. Sit down with your spouse or your best friend or whoever you're eating with and just chronicle what God has done in your life. This is why I love him. This is why I trust him. So that those answers are faster for you. The next thing is cast aside your defensiveness and your ego. This one's a tough one. Stephen didn't defend himself. He put it all on the line, amen? Amen. Put it all on the line. Risk some things. <sighs> what kind of risk is it in your front lawn while you're mowing your lawn and your neighbor walks up and wants to talk to you about this his name is Jesus thing? What kind of risk is there? There's real risk, yes. Well, our relationship might get weird now because now I'm the religious person in the neighborhood. If I start having this conversation our relationship is forever going to be different. Maybe they're going to have expectations of me. Maybe they're going to watch what I say and do from now on. Do I want that dynamic to change? Maybe risk a little bit. Here's another risk. If you enter into the conversation, you might not have all the answers. And you might not win the conversation. And if you're like me, if, if you're the kind of person who... Sometimes you don't even enter into a conversation unless you think you can succeed at it. You just hold back, yes? Now enter it anyway. Risk it. Risk failing. 
for their good. Risk looking silly and foolish and ignorant for their good. Risk it. Why? Because you love prodigals more than you love yourself. Stephen loved prodigals more than he loved himself. Yeah, first service was pretty silent too. It's hard stuff. Cast aside your defensiveness and your ego. Next, courageously answer. Speak in faith and trust. Don't change the subject. Speak the truth. Don't avoid and don't run. Next, chill and don't worry about convincing or converting the person. You don't have to win the conversation. Just help them. Plant a seed. Maybe just listen. Maybe own some things. I think the greatest seed that Stephen planted in that whole sermon that he gave was the word of forgiveness that he spoke out loud at the very end. And I don't think Stephen realized what the greatest seed he was planting that day was until the end. Success does not equal convincing or converting. You ever get into a conversation and you feel like you're supposed to take the conversation a direction. And what that does is that creates expectation on you and it creates pressure in the conversation. And all of a sudden, because of that pressure, the person feels like they're a project, not a person. So don't feel that pressure. Let go. Next, center your words on things that you know. Okay, this is, this is really shaky theologically. Um, Stephen talks primarily about the Old Testament in his whole speech that he gives. He talks very, very little, if you look at it, about Jesus. He hasn't talked about the miracles or the teachings of Jesus in there. He kind of hints at the cross of Jesus Christ and what Jesus had done there, but that's kind of it. Here's why I think this is just a theory. My theory is they didn't have the gospels at that time. They didn't have the New Testament Stephen was not one of the disciples that walked with Jesus for three years. I think Stephen, at this point, he was just months into the birth of the early church. He was learning. I think he knew some things, and I think powerful things had happened in his life. But as far as head knowledge, he didn't have a ton of it. So what did he do? He leveraged and used what he had. And he focused in on what he had. It's... I think sometimes we would be better off if we just spoke what we knew was true. And if people ask us questions and we don't know the answers, give the people your honesty and say, I don't know. Who knows? That humility might make a point. Um, when I was in college ministry, I went to a um, Bible study and I was leading a Bible study and uh, no, I'm sorry. I was attending a Bible study, attending. And I had only been saved for six months. And we got to the end of the Bible study and it was doing a lot for me. And when we got to the end, this guy named Jim Ranella, who led the ministry came and said, Josh, I want you to lead the next Bible study with this other guy. And I'm like, Jim, I can't lead a Bible study, man. I've only been saved six months. And he's like, you got six months to give to people who haven't. Give what you have. It was a good challenge. Because what Jim saw in me is he saw a lifelong excuse. He saw that I was going to hold back from moments of challenge because I was never going to feel qualified ever. Because you can't know everything, can you? Come on, second service. Trust the God who qualifies you. Be available and surrendered to him and trust him to help you in those conversations. And then lastly, care about them more than you care about yourself. Risk your reputation at work. Risk the weirdness. Risk all of it because you care more about the prodigals than you. Would you guys stand? There's a lot of challenge in all this. I want to walk us through a very practical prayer. I'm giving you a second to shuffle and to get settled. Sometimes we come to the end of the message 
and we just do a closing prayer and go into the song and that's it. I want this prayer to be a little bit more for you. I talked earlier about you need to pray, you need to ask God to send these people into your life. And that that's a bold prayer and I wanna pray it right now. And, and for those of you, you like connect your soul right to heaven during this prayer. I believe that God's gonna answer that prayer, amen? I think he's gonna shock you. So let's pray it. Lord God, you see every single heart, Lord, that's around us. And so Lord, those that are being stirred by the spirit right now, those who are spiritually ready, God, I pray, Lord, that you would start steering them toward us. And God, I pray that we would step into those moments with courage and compassion, that, that mix that Stephen had, Lord, that Jesus has. Give us that. And Lord, I pray for connections all over the place, God. I pray that you would do miracles all over the place. I pray, Lord, that you would grow us up, that you would challenge us, Lord, forward in our faith, even if we don't feel like we've got very much to give, that we would give what it is that we have. Grow us up, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that many prodigals would come back to you, Father. We long for that. You called us the light of the world. Help us to be the light of the world, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.